Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's July 16, 2021, and today we are bringing you a recorded live seminar from the Myanmar Update 2021 conference. Every Myanmar Update conference has a political update, an economic update, and thematic sessions like so. Today, it's the political update that we present to you. And this year's special presenter is Dr. Morton Pedersen, Senior Lecturer in International and Political Studies at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, the Australian Defence Force Academy. This seminar was dual delivery, meaning there were online attendees and there were in-person attendees. After Morton concludes his talk, there's a Q&A session. Some of the questions are read by Dr. Edward Aspinall, who is convening this seminar, and some are delivered by the questioners themselves in front of the podium in the lecture theatre at the University in Canberra. Unfortunately, not all of the questioners could be identified, but most of them are introduced. Without further ado, I hand over to Ed Aspinall. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure for me to participate uh, in this conference. Let me begin by saying that we acknowledge and celebrate the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respect to their elders past and present. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our, our um, political update speaker today, uh, Morton Pedersen, who's a senior lecturer in international and political studies at the University of New South Wales here in Canberra. Morton has a really sterling pedigree of publications on Myanmar politics and international policy uh, towards uh, Myanmar. I'm sure many of you uh, here today or online uh, will very much be aware of his several books and many other writings uh, on the, this topic. In addition, he has a long history as being a, a policy advisor, consultant and analyst um, of Myanmar politics. He's consistently been a source of incredibly clear, lucid, careful and wise analysis of Myanmar politics down the year. So it's particularly fitting that he presents the uh, political update in what has been such a critical year. And uh, we look forward to the, him overcoming the challenge of doing that within just 30 minutes. Thanks, Morton. Thank you. It. Um, I have to admit I was um, a little bit in two minds about accepting this challenge because obviously my task here today will be to sort of try to make sense of something that has at a very deep level um, affected uh, so many of our friends and, and colleagues and, and of course millions of people that we don't know uh, in, in Myanmar and beyond. Now, if this conference had been held uh, six months ago, uh, then my job would have been to uh, reflect on the track record of the NLD government, uh, including its uh, many failures, at least if you listen to the critics. So I would probably have had to try to explain why, despite all of those failures, they still managed to win uh, a landslide uh, election in the, in the elections in November last year. Uh, but instead, of course, it'll be all about the coup, and I will just sort of jump directly to that, uh, the coup that took place on the very day that this newly elected parliament was supposed to uh, convene. Now, this wasn't the first coup in Myanmar, obviously. It also wasn't particularly surprising uh, in the region, and so in the sense that we have seen a resurgence of military influence in, uh, on politics in the region in recent years. Uh, but it didn't come after a decade of, of course, democratic reform, growing civil and political freedoms, and it has hit the country as, as an earthquake. But it has truly shattered uh, the hopes of millions of people who were finally perhaps beginning to believe that uh, for the first time in their lives that you know, tomorrow might just be better than today. Right? There was... There was a lot of things that wasn't changing as fast as people wanted, but there was real hope for the future in Myanmar until the coup happened. Now, much of the political commentary on the coup has combined outrage um, over the, the military's action with a fair amount of wishful thinking uh, that it can in some way be overcome, can be defeated. Uh, I share the outrage, but I'm sorry to say to all me and my friends, I don't share the optimism, the wishful thinking. There's really no way uh, that this is going to end well 
Um, and the only question is really how bad it's going to get. And while I don't offer advice to anybody, at least not in my sort of initial remarks today, uh, I do believe that any strategic decisions, whether they are made by domestic actors or international ones, must be based on a sort of hard-nosed, clear-eyed, honest analysis of the actual challenges that the resistance and the country more generally face. So that's basically sort of the framing of, of, of uh, or the tone of, of my remarks today. Now I'm going to try to do three things. Um, I will start by briefly highlighting some of the key aspects of the uh, current political crisis. And then I'm going to try to answer two key questions uh, that have been the focus of much of the, the post-coup uh, post uh, commentary and, and analysis. So basically, uh, what are the reasons or what were the reasons for the coup and what uh, is the likely outcome looking into uh, to the future? Now, the answers to these two more analytical questions will necessarily be somewhat speculative. That's nothing new for those of us who study uh, Myanmar politics. They will ultimately depend on our underlying understanding of uh, how Myanmar politics works in general, and in particular, how the, the Tatmadaw, the Burmese military works. Um, but basically what I do is that I apply what some would call a historical institutional lens, uh, which is basically sort of a fancy word for taking uh, the past seriously, the legacies of the past seriously. And I have found that over the 25 years or so that I've been working on Myanmar, that approach has proved pretty useful and in fact often uh, even able to predict uh, significant events in, in, in Myanmar politics. Um, now, I'm fully aware that a lot of people, in a sense, are arguing against that. They are saying everything has changed as a result of the coup. We are now living in a new Myanmar. It will never be the same again. But I'm not convinced that that is, in fact, the case. I would be more than happy to be proven wrong. But as far as my analysis go, I will keep a very close eye on uh, what has happened historically. Now, the coup leaders have insisted uh, that the coup uh, is, in fact, not a coup, but is simply a temporary military takeover to deal with a state of emergency that they claim was necessitated by the refusal of the MLD government to deal honestly with allegations of massive electoral fraud in the 2020 general elections. Now, I think we are all probably aware that this claim has been roundly dismissed by all objective observers. But nonetheless, it has clearly framed the subsequent actions of the military in significant ways. So Senior General Min Aung Hlaing, in his very first public statement uh, on the morning of the coup, declared that the military intended to hold power only for a year under the emergency provisions of the 2008 constitution, after which they would hold fresh elections and hand power back to a new elected government. And so far, at least, he does seem to be sticking to that story, right? So although the deadline uh, has been pushed out, I think military spokespersons have been talking about two years recently, uh, and the constitution would still uh, would actually allow up to, I think, two and a half years, uh, that is still the, the official kind of framing of the, of the coup uh, by the, the, the military leadership. The main focus of this coup administration, and I call it deliberately a coup because that is what it was, in the interim supposedly would be to investigate these uh, claims of uh, electoral fraud. They would step up, fight against COVID, uh, and they would revive the economy. And if anybody's smiling, it's probably because that's six months down the road, not a whole lot has happened there. Uh, in any case, otherwise, it was basically going to be a, a caretaker government, a, a concept that we're fairly familiar with from past uh, uh, history in Myanmar, right? Uh, the, the economic policies, the foreign policies uh, supposedly would remain the same and work on the peace process would continue and, and, and so on and so forth. At least that was the plan. And in line with this uh, essentially conservative agenda, the new governing bodies that have been set up, including uh, the new uh, Legislative State Administrative Council, SAC, uh, and also the new cabinets, uh, include a mix of military and civilians, including some well-respected uh, bureaucrats. Now, given the seemingly fraudulent nature of the allegations of electoral fraud, no pun intended, it is perhaps tending, uh, tempting to simply sort of dismiss this, right? Dismiss these promises. But based on the military's track record, based on how they have actually done things in response to their own promises in the past, 
I think we would actually do well to take them seriously, although with uh, a few important caveats. First, while the military may well be planning to hand back power once they've sorted things out, they are clearly taking steps to eliminate the main competition. Right? So Aung San Suu Kyi has been charged with no less than seven uh, criminal offenses by last count, will probably go up tomorrow. Um, and there's also been uh, sort of muted threats uh, that the, her entire party, the National League for Democracy, might be banned because of its role in these alleged uh, electoral, uh, in this alleged, uh, alleged electoral fraud. Secondly, the military is highly unlikely to proceed with actual new elections until they feel that they are in total control uh, of the situation. And this, of course, I'm sure all can understand, is very likely to take a lot longer than two years. Uh, last time it took 22 years. Right? Similar promises 22 years later finally happened. But it did happen. Thirdly, while there may well be an intention to maintain in broad uh, terms the existing foreign and economic policies, the new council has wasted no time in passing a raft of new um, repressive sort of security laws that are fundamentally altering the political space, you know, certainly the, the, the level of, of civil and political uh, freedom. So clearly any sort of new version of what came before the coup of Myanmar's sort of so-called disciplined flourishing, flourishing democracy will be characterized by more discipline and less freedoms than was the case before uh, the coup. Now, that's the military's plan, at least as they have explained it to us. Uh, I think we all understand uh, that so far they have struggled to get their way. The coup has been massively rejected by the Myanmar people. Um, and despite months of violent repression, the coup leaders are clearly struggling to consolidate their control um, of the country. Now, initially, as we've heard, the resistance was, uh, I think, very self-consciously, very deliberately nonviolent. You know, it was characterized by peaceful street protests. There was this large civil disobedience campaign, you know, with thousands of people quitting their, both their government jobs and, and jobs in the, in the private sector. Uh, there were boycotts, consumer boycotts of military product, uh, products and, and so on and so forth. Over time, however, the violent military crackdown that followed has seen a growing radicalization of uh, the resistance movement, which is much reduced in numbers in terms of sort of the numbers of people out in the streets uh, actively taking place, uh, but has shifted um, or is now increasingly dominated by armed uh, actors with all the implications that that have. At the same time, the goals of the resistance have shifted from restoration of the status quo ante to essentially revolutionary demands for you know, abolishment of the 2008 constitution, uh, uh, banishment essentially of the military uh, from politics and introduction of what they refer to as a genuine federal democracy. There's even been talk about recognizing the Rohingya as citizens of Myanmar, although I suspect that this sentiment is probably less widely shared than the others. Now, the violence of the military has succeeded in forcing most people off the streets, and it does appear to be making some inroads also into the, the civil disobedience movement, although very slowly. But the armed response, in turn, has mushroomed and now has several key dimensions including never before seen urban guerrilla warfare in, in Yangon and in, in Mandalay. Uh, we've got new armed rebellions popping up in rural areas and parts of the country where uh, there hasn't been any before, at least not for a very long time. Um, and then, of course, we've seen increased activities by some of the longstanding armed ethnic organizations. Hundreds, if not thousands, of formerly peaceful protesters have been trained by especially the KNU and the KIO in their base areas in the mountains. And it looks like they are now infiltrating back into the cities and towns where they've launched a campaign, campaign of targeted assassinations, not just of soldiers, but actually of civilian government officials, uh, politicians, elect informers, uh, et cetera. Over time, we've seen the emergence of a sort of a formal political leadership of the resistance in the form uh, of a legislative committee made up of actually elected members of parliament, the CRPH, 
And then this so-called national unity government, NUG, which is basically trying to build a, a united front across these disparate elements of, um, of the, the resistance. They even added or are aiming to set up a, a, a military arm, the, the People's Defense Forces. I think, however, it's important to underline, at least as I see it, that for most intents and purposes, the resistance is still best understood as a grassroots movement which, while strictly speaking, is certainly not leaderless, has so many different local leaders and different local agendas that it is far from being a monolithic or even sort of in a meaningful sense, united force. Now, the impact of all of this has been devastating. Um, so according to, and this is where the slide finally comes into the picture, according to what I consider the most authoritative uh, source, uh, but probably uh, we're looking at very conservative numbers. We have almost a thousand protesters that have been killed by the security forces. More than 6,000 have been arrested. 250 have been sentenced. About 1,500 have been released, but a lot are still just sitting uh, in jail. We've seen more than 200,000 people displaced uh, across the country, including from uh, the main cities. The resistance, most of these, by the way, are still internally displaced, but right? we have seen refugees uh, moving across the borders into India and Thailand in particular, but those numbers are still relatively small. Uh, the resistance in turn claims to have killed hundreds of soldiers and probably have, as well as a growing number, as I said, of government officials and alleged collaborators. And there's been several hundred defectors, if not more, from the military and the police uh, although as far, uh, so far, no senior officers, uh, which is sort of significant in terms of the political implications. I'm not sure that we will ever know for sure why the military staged this coup. Uh, these decisions, of course, are taken in secret uh, and they're taken by secretive men and a few women maybe, but mainly men. I don't think many of them have even frankly talked to their close colleagues about why they might be supporting this. They might be sort of spouting the, 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 the official line, but whatever they are, their, their private minds are about it, uh, I don't think they share very widely. Uh, and I base that particularly on the fact that, you know, many, many years after the first few coups in Myanmar back in 58, 62, and of course in 1988, there's still significant controversy and debate about why those coups took place. You know, so I don't think we should kid ourselves about, about being sort of able to answer uh, the, the, that particular question, at least with any degree of, uh, of, of certainty. It is, however, a question I think we have to address because it is a more, a more, of more than academic interest. Why right? it, it matters in terms of our thinking about the future development challenges in Myanmar as well as the, the correct or the, the optimal strategies for how to, to deal with the coup. As far as I can see, there are at least three broad sort of plausible mm -hmm. explanations of this coup. And I think and that's uh, my personal, personal preference is to start with the personal interest of Senior General Min Aung Hlaing. Now, the senior general has made no secret uh, of the fact that he has or had ambitions to probably still have ambitions to become president. And the election results in November last year, of course, brought that dream crashing down. This, I think, we can imagine would have been a huge blow to his ego, uh, but also to his personal security. So as commander in chief, uh, under normal condi conditions, he was uh, facing compulsory retirement in July, I think, this year. So actually this month, right? And this would have left him without any formal power or reliable means to protect his interests, including the threat that he faces by being under investigation by the International Criminal Court for his role in the army's mass atrocities against the Rohingya. Now, his predecessor, Senior General Dan Sui, he overcome, or overcame this sort of perennial dilemma of other authoritarian leaders by essentially placing trusted officers in key positions in the military as well as in the first post-military government, the Thane Sang government that he handed over uh, power to. But I suspect that Min Aung Hlaing has never actually been able to establish the same degree of control over the Tatmado as uh, Than Sui did. And he may well have felt, or perhaps not felt confident that he would be able to do the same thing. So if all of these or most of these assumptions are right, then basically what the coup has offered him is a solution to many of his personal problems. And I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the very first actions of the SAC just a couple of days after the coup, although we only learned about it later, 
was to essentially remove the age limits for the senior general and his deputy. So he can now in principle stay uh, in that position as long as he wants. Now, personal motivations matter immensely in a political system that is as highly personalized as the Burmese, but it's still hard to imagine that Minang Lai would have been able to carry out a coup if there hadn't been wider support for it within the military, certainly within the top levels uh, of the military. And I think this is where much of the pre-coup analysis actually missed the point. Now, over the past 10 years, the dominant narrative, in the, at least in the English-speaking press, but also in, in a fair bit of the scholarly literature, has uh, basically been uh, that the military had sort of pulled it off, right? Uh, that the transition away from direct milita military rule actually served their, their interest uh, quite uh, nicely. Now, some have suggested, and in fact, nothing much ever really changed, you know, that the military for most intents and purposes remain in, in power. Uh, others said, well, even if there was a significant transfer of power, it seemed that Aung San Suu Kyi and, and her, her government, well, at least re refrained from challenging any of the main prerogatives of, of the military. And of course, there has also been accusations that she was even kind of covering up and justifying uh, their abuses um, and I think that narrative is why the coup uh, came as, as big a surprise as it did to a lot of observers. But I also think that narrative was always deeply flawed. Now, many of the post-2011 reforms, as I understand it at least, were not planned, uh, that they probably never had the full support of many senior officers. It seems clear that President Painsane and his sort of super cabinet, those five or six ministers that were working very closely with him, uh, that they basically went off script uh, after they you know, retired and, and took over this first uh, post-military administration in 2011. Now, they got away with it because they were really successful, right? They were able to get you know, Western sanctions lifted. They were able to attract a lot of new foreign investment. The reputation of the military improved uh, significantly. So there wasn't any sort of early pushback, at least not major pushback from, from other parts of the military, although we do know about some pushback. And we do know that some of these ministers were actually quite worried about it. They would say to people that they met, we don't know whether we'll be in jail next week. Right? There, was, there was definitely concern within that circle about what the response would be. And um, what we also know, I think, is that by the time we got to, um, to the 2015 elections, there was gen genuine uh, and real anxiety and, and debate within the military about the wisdom of, of basically handing over the keys to the government to Aung San Suu Kyi. And, you know, those keys did come, whatever the speculation has been, those keys did come with real power. Aung San Suu Kyi did, did have real power to, to change a whole range of things. Since this decision, since uh, the NLD government took over, basically what we've been seeing, although it's hard to get you know, a real clear view into it, uh, is growing or was growing tensions between uh, the civilian and the military side of this sort of two-headed government. Right, so uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and Min Aung Lai, certainly at a, per at a personal level, clearly disliked each other. They hardly ever met after the first few meetings, uh, studiously avoided each other. Um, but also at the more sort of institutional level, uh, the NLD government may not have openly challenged the military on sort of the big stuff, but they certainly snubbed them on numerous occasions. So, the appointment of Aung San Suu Kyi as state councillor, uh, the refusal by her specifically to convene the National Defence and Security Council, the appointment of a civilian national security advisor, uh, the establishment of an independent inquiry into you know, the events in Rakhine State, the transfer of the General Affairs Department to the, uh, the, I mean, you know, to, the to, uh, to the Ministry of the Office of, of the Union Government, away from the Minister of Home Affairs, which the military controlled. Uh, all of these things would have been perceived as uh, by the military as outside or not in line with the spirit of the 2008 Constitution, uh, and as they uh, as they perceived it. Right. So there was definitely growing dissatisfaction and tensions uh, there between the, the NLD and the military for several years uh, leading up uh, to, uh, to the coup. And I suspect, but this is guesswork more than based on real knowledge, that by the time the NLD secured a second landslide victory, 
that would have been real fear within the military that they might use that as uh, sort of a, a way of doing essentially an end run around the constitution and perhaps we're, we're planning to challenge the military's interest in even more uh, fundamental ways. But we haven't, uh, yes, as yet, at least as far as I know, not a lot of information has come out about those discussions. Now, it's possible that the 2020 election results effectively sealed uh, the fate of, of Myanmar's uh, embryonic democracy. But it's also possible that Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD made one sort of final and, and fatal mistake in purely dismissing the military's allegations of electoral fraud. Just because to objective observers, uh, there was no indication of actually, uh, at least not you know, significant uh, fraud that would have sort of changed the election result. That doesn't mean that the military didn't think uh, that there was. And there were lots of complaints even before the elections coming out from sort of military circles about the voters list, about the, the cancellation of, of the elections in, in certain areas. Uh, about the supposed abuse by the NLD government of you know, government resources for electoral purposes, including COVID payments. Now, we can all smile a bit about that because that's, of course, exactly the, the sort of the way that the, the military and the USDP have done things in the past. But nonetheless, nonetheless they were clearly upset about this heading into uh, to the, to, to, to the elections. And whatever they may or may not have thought about the election results, I think we can be pretty certain that they would have been insulted by the flat out refusal by the NLD and the Union Election Commission to take any of their complaints seriously. Now, there was a clear sense in the, the month, especially of January leading up to, to the coup, that more and more people within the military were really getting quite angry uh, about this. <coughs> So I'm running out of time, despite my best planning, but let me see what I can get through before I have to finish. Now, for me online, this dismissal uh, would not only have been a personal kind of affront, offense, but a threat to his image of authority. And I think we all understand how important that image of authority would be to a military leader. Right? I'm not saying for sure that if the NLD had done things differently, that wouldn't have been a coup, but there has been plausible speculation that there might still have been ways to avoid it. Of course, we don't know yet, at least I don't know, exactly what kind of demands that the military were making uh, in those final discussions uh, before the coup actually happened. Now, I think any number of things from among these sort of three general types of explanations might have been part of it, right? The coup didn't happen. Now, every individual didn't sort of justify the coup to him or herself for the same reasons, right? So it could be a mix uh, of things, but I think at least what we got up there uh, is, a, is a good place to start. My next big question, which I'll have to order, uh, answer more briefly than I had planned, is this idea about or some thinking about what the likely outcome uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the coup is. Now, some analysts are convinced that the revolution will succeed. They argue that the resistance uh, to the coup has brought the country together in a way that it's never been before. And that this groundswell that we are seeing you know, of opposition is basically wearing down the military uh, and eventually will lead to, uh, lead to its collapse. Now, some have suggested that there is dissatisfaction uh, among sort of the silent backers uh, mm -hmm. of the military and that you know, work is on the way to get rid of men online and get a new uh, commander in chief in who might sort of walk back the coup. Uh, others have suggested that we are likely to see such massive defections from the military that it will eventually uh, collapse. But the bottom line is that there is a fair bit of analysis out there that is essentially optimistic, right? People who think that, okay, things are really, really bad now, uh, but we can win this. And of course, many people within the persistence believe the same thing. Now, another common but much more pessimistic view is that no one will win this battle, right? That the country is descending into an all out and protracted civil war that will essentially rip it apart. And this notion of a failed state at the heart of Asia has been a, a central sort of theme here, along with the parallels drawn to uh, what happened in Syria uh, about 10 years ago and you know, basically up until now. Now, there's one thing that both sides of this argument seem to agree on, and that is that there's no going back, you know, that the military won't be able to reestablish control 
of the country or reinstate any kind of sort of revised power sharing uh, arrangement under the 2008 constitution. I'm not so sure about that. And I have in my paper listed a number of reasons why I'm not so sure about that, which I will leave out now, but maybe we can get into some of it um, in, the, in the question and, and answers. I do want to just make sure if I can have a few more minutes, uh, I don't want to end on, on a too pessimistic note, right? So is there any hope in all of this? Even if you don't believe, if you don't believe that the resistance can win, is there any hope left? I think there might be. And I might be guilty now of the same kind of wishful thinking that I sort of started out saying that we should start, start to you know, try to get away from. But, but nonetheless, let me just end on a couple of more positive notes. First of all, I think we need to remember that although right now in the midst of the carnage, the brutality, it looks like we're de dealing with a military that is sort of uniform, uh, uniformly violent, right, unrepentant. Let me just remind you that it was a number or a handful of very senior, recently retired military generals who undertook the beginning of the reforms that led to the progress over the last 10 years. Then Fain Sain and the people around him, they came out of that same brutal military, yet they were the catalyst of a lot of the positive things that we've seen. Some people even argue that in some respects they did better than the MLB, although I think in other ways they probably didn't. So this idea that is very popular now, that there is no way there is anybody in the military who is ever going to behave any differently, uh, I think is one that we need to be very careful about. The other, and in, in many ways, much bigger seed of hope is the Gen Z, right? Uh, we've all seen what they are capable of. Uh, we've seen, and I've been particularly impressed by these visions that we now hear coming out of a much more inclusive, a more tolerant, a more just society. Uh, we don't really know how widespread those sentiments are, but they are being expressed by a range of leaders and individuals who we know that even before all of this had a major influence on, on that generation and at least the political active part of it. Right? So if I can end on this, there is the possibility that some way down the road, I don't want to put years on it, a new generation of military reformers will be in a position to perhaps take us back in a more positive direction. This won't happen as long as people are fighting. It'll happen down the road when things, for whatever reason, have stabilized. If they do that, and if by that time we've seen a generational shift within the sort of the civilian side of things, away from uh, the older leaders of the past and of the government, and with a greater voice for this gener uh, generation set and this new vision of Myanmar, well, we just may see uh, something more positive down the road. But as I said, from now at least, that is probably wishful thinking. Yes. Thank you very much, Morton, and thanks for keeping uh, your comments so concise. I'll now invite people to um, ask questions on the Q&A. Perhaps we'll start with someone in the audience. Just jumping in here to introduce the questioner. This is Hunter Marston, PhD candidate at the Australian National University. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Morton, for the uh, terrific remarks. A uh, lot to think about. Uh, one potential scenario I noticed you did not raise was the prospect of a power sharing agreement. Do you think it's completely impossible that if uh, extended fighting across the country weakened the Tatmadaw to a point where it was forced to the negotiating table, that it could potentially reconcile with some form of national unity government or uh, elected government. Thanks. Uh, you're absolutely right. That could have been up there as, as, a, as a false scenario, you know, running out of space on my slide and time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, two reasons maybe why I didn't feel it was so important to have it out there as one of the main ones. Uh, first of all, both sides have made it very, very clear that they have absolutely no interest in this. Uh, there's no going back. Uh, as far as the resistance go, uh, we are not negotiating now. We are, we are going all up. We want to win. We want to change everything. That's what a lot of the leaders, only, only not only at the form, formal political level, but also at the grassroots level, say. Right? The other reason why uh, I sort of hesitate to, to sort of bring that up is that there's, to my mind, really no examples in Myanmar history of anybody genuinely negotiating anything. Uh, the only real you know, exception, and I think it is actually a real exception, it is part of the peace talks that took place before the signing of the, of the 
the, the national ceasefire agreement. That, that was some give and take there. Uh, and that involves some very specific individuals and so on and so forth. But if you look beyond that, I have had several Burmese, uh, including within the, the military, telling me that it seems to not be in our culture to negotiate. Um, and of course, another thing that's definitely not in the culture, certainly of the military, is to accept any kind of mediation from outside, yeah, at least not as we traditionally understand it. And we know that in order for these kinds of deals to be worked out in most places around the world, it requires external mediation. And I don't think that's very likely to happen in, in Myanmar. Power sharing may emerge, but not as a result of, of negotiations and give and take. It's going to be sort of a, a decision made I think by the military to go back down that road and then a, a position that is willing by then to accept it as happened last time, right? but that took 20 years. Thanks, Morton. And we do have questions coming in now online. So let's ask the first one. And this is from David Kamru in Paris. Uh, following on your preliminary comments, can you list briefly uh, what you saw as the chief failures of Aung San Suu Kyi's government? I, I, don't, know, I don't recall if that means I mean, you could keep it concise. Look, I mean, there were a lot of different people who were upset about a, a lot of different things about the, the, the NLD administration. Now, obviously, given the election results, uh, and we kind of knew this beforehand, these were leaders of, of different groups, right? Civil society, business, uh, ethnic minorities. When it came down to the ordinary of people of Myanmar, clearly they didn't feel the same way, or at least they didn't feel that they have a better choice. I think if you kind of look for a common threat in the, in the criticism that I've heard or read about, it came down to the centralizing and even authoritarian tendencies of that government, right? There, there were a lot of people who, when Aung San Suu Kyi came in, they were, they were ready to go. They were gonna work together with her and her government and together they were gonna achieve big things. They were basically all told to go away, right? They centralized everything. Uh, and as a result of that, they failed, for example, on the peace process, at least for a long, long time, it wasn't looking very good uh, with the economy. So any of those sort of big things. And here is Nicola Williams, PhD candidate at ANU. Thanks, Morton. Uh, your, one of your scenarios focused on state collapse. Um, and this is something I sort of talked a little bit about yesterday in terms of state functional failure that's always been persistent and institutional collapse has never resulted in actual state collapse. What variables do you see at play here to lead to that rare and quite disastrous scenario of full state collapse? I mean, I guess the, the fundamental idea behind this, I mean, I, I guess you should start by saying, you know, we are talking comparatively, right? Because as a lot of people have said, well, I mean, hasn't the Myanmar state always already collapsed? Or was it ever never, never really a state in any meaningful sense? And what's any different now, right? I think those pessimistic kind of warnings out there have imagined something worse than that, right? And so as I understand it, basically what they are saying is that given what we've seen in terms of resistance to the military, the, the military will not be able to, in a sense ever, or at least for the foreseeable future, establish control even of the central parts of the country, right? We all know that, that, that the periphery has been collapsed in that sense, you know, since, well, since independence, right? Uh, but I think what they are suggesting is that it, it will be a similar kind of predicament will affect, you know, the main cities. And because of that, uh, the military really won't be able to have any kind of sort of meaningful government in, 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 in any way, right? And obviously, in many ways, that is kind of a description of what we are seeing right now, right? So the question is, is it going to continue to be like that? Or is it, that, as I kind of suggested, that I suspect that while it may take some time, eventually the military will be able to reestablish more control than that? And why do I say that? Well, history tells us that that's what happens every time. They've been out in the corners of the boxing ring a number of times historically. They've always managed to claw their way back and establish control. And I'm not convinced, despite mobile phones, generation sets, social media, all of that, I'm not convinced that that part has changed fundamentally. Thanks, Morden. Let's go to the next uh, question online from an, on, an, an anonymous attendee. Um, and this is basically the question about where the military reformers are now. I don't know if there's a, a note of scepticism underlying this question, but the question basically is why are they, why are they remaining sil silent when the leadership is, um, you know, sort of running riot, I suppose. 
Well, I mean, first of all, I can't put names on it. Actually, in the past 10 years ago, you know, before the reformers came through, we already had an idea about this. I remember giving an interview with some radio station uh, before the 2010 elections and talking about, is there any chance of real change? Uh, and I said, well, based on what I've been hearing from the Burmese people, not anything I've experienced, but from Burmese people, we got a couple of, of potential leaders who seem to be better than many others in the military. Those two leaders were Feng Tseng and Sui Man. And I'm not making this up. We knew this from people's experience with them in their role as regional commanders, et cetera, et cetera. I cannot, in a similar way, put names on any performance within the military. I'm simply not close uh, to them. If the question is, why are they not speaking up? Uh, well, my assumption is that when you are in the middle of what is essentially an existentialist struggle, then hardliners uh, have the upper hand, always. Right. This is not a time for anybody within the military to speak up uh, about compromises with what I think many other parts of the military now see as, as the enemy. Right? If they are ever going to have a key role, it will be, and maybe I lack imagination here, but in some replay of what we saw in 2011, where they are handed power in a civilian position and they are able to use that to then kind of begin to, to, to operate more, more normally. It will not happen as long as there's an all-out civil war. A quick incursion here to introduce Salai Samuel Hmong, graduate student at ANU. Uh, I have two questions. One is about, so uh, some uh, reliable media yesterday, they reported that oh, Suji met with me online in Nipido. So do you think it, there will be, are we seeing a different like radical shift or is that there's another stand of the military? That is one question. And another one is that uh, how does the COVID play in this scenario? Or Because we have an outbreak now in the country and uh, so, some people said that the uh, military is weaponizing the COVID to oppress the, the, uh, uh, the, the protester. But some people also said that they, it, because of the mismanagement, like shutting down the uh, oxygen plant, uh, that also create uh, discontent amongst its supporter and its also ground troops. So yeah, so that that uh, so that, uh, what do you think about the how the COVID outbreak? Because before we have a state collapse, we already have a help help center collapse in the country. So look, uh, I hadn't heard that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and Min Aung had met. Uh, it does. Surprised me, but I suppose they've met other times before, you know, without much coming out of it. So I'd have to say, watch that space, right? Anything about, you know, without knowing anything about what they were talking about, what the conditions were. Is it just men online sort of pretending to the world that he's being reasonable? I mean, who knows, right? Like with a lot of other things in Myanmar, you know, we, we kind of have to watch it play out for a little bit before we really have any basis for it. If it means that half of what I've said up here is wrong, I'm more than happy to swallow that and, and you know, take uh, progress sooner than I just predicted. Right? As far as COVID goes, I mean, it's just tragic. Right? I mean, we, we knew this was going to come. We've been watching the pictures from India and there was no way in the current situation that this wasn't going to come into Myanmar. Uh, and was potentially hit it even harder. I mean, I know you were speculating that it might be make people even more angry. I mean, who knows down the road, but I think in the short term, it's it's going to be the opposite. Why right? people are going to be preoccupied with with grief, with surviving, with, with with you know surviving also economically, right? Because presumably things will not be shut down again and so forth. So I I suspect it might actually take a little bit of the fuel out of, of, of the resistance. It might allow the military to kind of step in and begin doing what they said in the beginning that they were going to do, that this was one of their primary objectives was to do something about this COVID epidemic. Who knows? They might even not be bad at it. I mean, a lot of this is logistical, right? Uh, and the military is probably pretty good at logistics. But again, it's, it's speculation. I don't know. I certainly don't. I mean, what government has managed to get, to get this third or fourth or whatever wave it is under control? What are the chances that the military, even if they do a bit more, will be able to do so? I think we're just going to look at more misery, right? And it's going to be a long time before they get that under control. Thank you. Let's go to the next online question, which is, uh, Morton, do you think that the activists have misdiagnosed uh, what's going on with the coup, thinking that this is a return to 
you know, complete uh, military authoritarianism, I suppose, rather than some of the more sort of hybrid options of the past. Um, and is, are those options really so bad compared to what we know about the failings of the NLT? Okay, that's, that's a dangerous question, right? Because uh, depending on my answer, I could make a lot of people very angry. Uh, look, I, I actually want to, and I genuinely want to express some solidarity here, right? I do not believe that I'm in a position to look at the decisions that these individual activists or even the collective have made and say you are wrong. Right. I mean, they are out there in the streets. They are being killed, but they see people get shot right next to them. Uh, they see that the protesters are, are being driven off, off the street. I mean, how, how can they not turn more radical? I mean, how, how can they not at least turn to arms? Maybe if I can be a little bit critical, it's more about this new agenda, this, this idea that nothing else would be acceptable but something totally different, something we've never had in Myanmar, the military out of politics. Uh, now, if that's just sort of the, the, the first play in an in a extracted you know, sort of conversation and negotiation, you'll find that that's what, what people do before they go into bargaining. I suspect that it's not. Um, but I think if they don't change their mind about that, uh, and, and and their strategy around that, I think they will miss if any opportunities were to occur for at least taking a step back from from the total collapse. Good morning, thanks for the presentation. And um, when you cited um, reasons for the coup and and um, Min Aung in particular retirement age, um, to what extent, if any, do you think that these international accountability mechanisms, um, you know, the ICC, the ICJ, sort of played any role at all? I mean. Around the time, it seemed that um, you, um, that there were certain comments made that you know people hadn't followed the chain of command. This was a few bad apples um, by Min Aung Hlaing and his clique. You know, was there always a concern that he could be held out, uh, yes, hung out to dry? Um, and the second question um, is on sort of you know this new agenda, and and part of it is you know against the military, and they shouldn't have a, a role in politics. But part of it is also against the NLD and the old status quo. So, so how, how do you see these different parts of the opposition sort of um, with sort of these very divergent views sort of um, figuring it out or, or coming together or not? Look, I, I think, I mean, I don't know anything about how at a personal level, I mean, online has responded to, you know, the, the threat of, 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 a, of a being, you know, possibly someday prosecuted in The Hague. Uh, what I can say is that one of the sort of arguments about international policy that we've heard is that, you know, the coup happened because we did not respond to the genocide, that we did not pursue accountability. That does not make any sense to me, first of all, because we actually did pursue accountability, we being sort of the international community, right? There was actually some pretty serious efforts to, you know, not successful, that's a long-term process, but certainly efforts to establish accountability. And if that in any way impacted the coup, it would have had to be the other way around. That once you're on the investigation by the International Criminal Court, you know, like every other leader in the world who's been in this position, that the only way you can be absolutely safe is to stay in power. The moment you lose power, uh, that's when you're vulnerable because then you might be sold out. I mean, Aung San Suu Kyi has given no indication that she was planning to do this. But if you were Men online, <laughs> Would you be comfortable, would you be confident that she never would? Or for that matter, that a new commander in chief wouldn't do it because he sees a chance or saw a chance to restore the military's uh, reputation. Uh, I understand all the arguments about justice. I understand all the demands for accountability, but politically, pragmatically, in a situation where the people you pursue are still in power, it is almost guaranteed to have detrimental effects for uh, the prospects of change. Uh, we got two different generations. I mean, I suppose in some sense, no, it's not quite a moot question. I mean, if, if, if Suu Kyi is, is out of the game and, you know, let's not go down that road and think too much in specifics, but, but if she's not coming back, then I think there will be a significant opening for the younger generation to exert more influence over where the country is going. With, with Suu Kyi in, in play, nobody really had an influence on that. It, it was about her thinking, her decisions. 
um, and nobody else, including more senior members of NLD, seemed to have had major influence on that. There might have been things around the margins, but it, it was her party, her country, her government. Um, so if she is not part of whatever future scenario we are talking about, one of the positive things of that, and I can think of some negative uh, effects as well, but the positive thing for me would be that that would probably give more voice, more space for some of these very, very impressive young activists that we are now seeing out there in the street, some of them with guns. Thanks. Let's go to the next online question, which comes from Ward Keeler. And it's a question about the extent to which you think the personal financial interests of the top military brass play the role in persuading them to go along with the coup. And there's also, I guess, a secondary question in there, uh, buried in there about uh, Min Ong Lane's uh, own uh, personal financial interests. So this is probably where I should reiterate my, my earlier kind of methodological comment about how, how we interpret things have a lot to do with our underlying understanding of, of how Burmese politics work, our assumptions about that, right? Because often we don't know enough to be absolutely certain why anybody does anything, right? So we are always interpreting. Now, there's a, a very strong sort of school of thought out there that really at the end of the day, this is all about economics, right? that the, 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 this whole obsession of the military with being in power has always been, or at least the last 30 years or so, have been about taking care of their, their economic interests. Now, we know that there's a lot more corruption in Myanmar today than there was uh, before the 88 coup as a result of, of a number of changes in the economy. So again, I don't know the private minds of any of these people that we're talking about, right? But my reading, my assumption of this has always been that economics come second, in a sense. That what the military is immediately focused on is issues around power and security. And of course, it all comes together because if you're still in power, then you also have control of, of the economic side of things. But if I can just fi finish with one more uh, you know, sort of factual observation, um, after the start of reform in 2011, especially the Thane Sen government actually took significant steps to limit the economic activities and the privileges of uh, the military as an institution. Right? And at least I'm not aware that there ever was a significant backlash to that within the military. Secondly, I'm not aware, and finally, I'm not aware of any major attempts, serious attempts by the NLD to challenge these economic interests, right? Maybe there's stuff that I don't know. Maybe some of these people who are in jail now were working on something that I don't know about. But to go back to my uh, initial statement, you know, how we answer a question that depend on how we understand the dynamics of uh, Myanmar politics. And to my mind, economics has actually, at the collective level, institutional level, has always been secondary to more political factors. That doesn't mean that for individual generals, it might be, not be different. Um, I wanted to ask about Thailand, what's going on there? Because as you know, there's a uh, whole series of border conflict, well, conflicts going on in the regions uh, adjacent to the thai Burma border. There's also a whole lot of uh, Burmese exile groups and activist movements, such as you know, the Free Burma Rangers and Irrawaddy and so forth. And of course, Thailand itself has gone through its own series of coups in the very recent past. So, uh, I suppose the question is, what's going on on the Thai side and how's that affecting Burma, if at all? Now, it may be that there are firmer answers to this, but since I'm not a Thai expert, I'm not sure my answers are any firmer than the ones I've been given previously. Been given previously. Um, one of the reasons why I'm very skeptical about this idea that this, you know, armed resistance can grow to a point where it will present any kind of significant threat is that, of course, in the past, it never has, uh, not the kind of threat we're talking about here, overthrowing power in NAPIDO. But the other reason is that it seems to me the international conditions for the resistance, the arms resistance, are much uh, less conducive than they actually were in the past, right? I think we all know that one of the reasons that the ethnic armed organizations uh, were able to maintain liberated zones and arm themselves and so on and so forth was that they were able to go back and cross about the, back and forth across the border with Thailand. You know, they could buy arms there, they could make money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was Thailand back then. Without being an expert on Thai affairs, the fact that we have a essentially a, a 
you know, semi-military government in, in charge in, in, in Thailand. The fact that Min Aung Hlaing supposedly has a close personal relationship with the now Prime Minister of, of Thailand, I will have to assume, and I think there's been some indication of this, that there will be a lot less space for support for the resistance in various ways to easily flow across the border, you know, for NGOs to operate freely within Thailand, you know, for arms traders to, to operate and so on and so forth. So my assumption is that the conditions for building up a, a armed resistance uh, are really not conducive and that Thai sort of factor is a significant part of that. Thank you very much, Morton, uh, for a very um, illuminating presentation. Thank you.